Good evening, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Gabriele Colcerto. I'm the manager of education and patient services for Myeloma Canada. I'd like to thank everyone from uh, across the country for uh, for joining us tonight for this uh, educational webinar on the latest myeloma research updates from the European Hematology Association 2018 meeting. This year, it took place uh, in June in Stockholm. And um, tonight our presenters, we're, we're privileged, we have not only one, but two presenters. We have Dr. Erwin Deep Sandu from uh, the Cross Cancer Institute, and we also have Dr. Julie Stackew from the Saskatoon Cancer Center, who will be our presenters. Before handing over uh, the microphone to them, I just wanted to go over a few things with you. Um, so all of our educational webinars are recorded and they're uploaded onto our YouTube channel. So if you miss something, don't worry. Um, you can go ahead and uh, and see it. And it's also, you can also access that from our website. Um, so from YouTube, if you just go to youtube.com, you type in Myeloma Canada in the search box, you'll see that the first link is our channel. Um, the other way you can you can get to the video is from, my, uh, from our website, myeloma.ca, clicking on the resources button at the top, and then on educational videos, uh, Myeloma Canada educational videos. Um, next, I'd like to go over, uh, um, if you have any, after the, after the webinar, if you have any problems uh, finding the video, you can always email me um, and I will uh, be happy to send you a direct link to the video. Um, so to ask questions, we're going to take questions at the end of the webinar. In order to do so, uh, on, on the right hand side on your GoToWebinar panel, you'll see a little tab that's questions. If you click on the little arrow, it'll open up and you can type your question here and once you're done typing your question, Press send. I will get the questions and I will be able to read them to uh, doctors uh, Sandu and Stakyu. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, I'm going to pass this along to uh, Dr. Stakyu, who will uh, who will start with uh, with her part of the presentation. Dr. Stucky? There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you. Perfect. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, for signing in and, and joining us tonight for this update based on a conference that uh, Erwin and I attended in June, as was indicated. Um, this is a bit of a new experience because I, I feel like I'm sitting here and talking to myself. Um, it looks like there are a few of you out there in the audience, so please don't hesitate to ask some questions at the end, uh, and we'll do our best to try to explain some of the new updates. What Erwin and I thought that we would do is start by uh, introducing myeloma a little bit, recognizing that for patients on the line, you all will likely be in a different phase of your myeloma journey. and to make sure that we're all on the same page and understanding some of the data, I just thought we'd start with a bit of an introduction uh, and then lead into the, the updates from there. I'm going to then give uh, an update on one of the oral presentations that uh, talked about how older patients do with autologous stem cell transplant. And Erwin will take over from there talking about a couple of presentations in the relapsed or refractory environment. And then I'll end by talking a little bit about CAR-T therapy, which is the up and coming, uh, hopefully very exciting treatment modality for myeloma in the future. So to start with, multiple myeloma is in the grand scheme of all cancers, not a very common one, but from a blood cancer point of view, constitutes about 10%. The annual incidence is about three to four per 100,000, and the median age, so that's the most frequent age that patients are diagnosed with multiple myeloma, is about 65. Multiple myeloma is associated with many symptoms, but from a diagnosis perspective, we use the mnemonic CRAB to help identify some of those clinical criteria. So the C in CRAB is an elevated calcium that we measure in the blood. 
the R is renal insufficiency. So that trouble with the kidneys and a myeloma that happens for a number of different reasons. A is anemia or a decreased hemoglobin, which helps deliver oxygen through the blood to the different tissues in the body. And then B is bone disease. And that's those little breaks in the bone or those punched out lesions that you might have been shown on some of your x-rays. The symptoms of myeloma are caused by some of these cells called plasma cells. And as you can see with this arrow pointing to, in the bone marrow, these plasma cells are normally less than 5% of all of the cells in the bone marrow. But in multiple myeloma, those cells start to grow and replicate and are essentially all of the same kind of cell being produced. These plasma cells produce antibodies. Just trying to see here. Oops, hang on, I'm going to go through this. Didn't format properly. The, the plasma cells essentially normally produce antibodies that help fight infection in the body. When you have all of the same kind of plasma cell, you're going to produce all of the same kind of antibody, and we call that a monoclonal protein because they're all the same kind, mono meaning just one kind of protein. And when we go to look for that protein in the blood, we do that by looking at a serum protein electrophoresis, and that type of lab test will separate all of the proteins in the body based on size and charge, and those antibodies or monoclonal proteins will migrate out into this particular region and you get a spike in this region because you're making all the same type of protein. So antibodies go by different names depending on the type of antibody being produced. Commonly, you'll have IgG. You can also have IgA and sometimes IgM. Then you have a subcomponent sometimes. That's either kappa or lambda. Sometimes you only have the subcomponent kappa or lambda being produced, and generally those are identified on a different type of blood test called the serum free light chain assay. We use both the serum protein electrophoresis and the serum free light chain assay to quantify the amount of monoclonal protein being produced by the plasma cells in the bone marrow. So to make the diagnosis of multiple myeloma, we kind of need three things. We need that monoclonal protein. We need those symptoms, so those, that CRAB criteria, we called it. And then you need those plasma cells being produced in the bone marrow. So now that we know what multiple myeloma is, we can identify our common treatment approach, at least in the upfront setting uh, in Canada. So that still is differentiating right off the bat whether or not patients when they're diagnosed with multiple myeloma would be candidates for an autologous stem cell transplant or whether based on age, kind of how they're feeling in day-to-day -day life and some of the other illnesses they might have might not be the best candidates for transplant. And we generally go down those two different paths right off the bat in treating patients. And so if you're a non-transplant candidate, there are a few different regimens across Canada that are used. Revlimid and dexamethasone, Cyborg-D or Cyborg-P, sometimes VMP depending on, on where you live. If you're a transplant candidate, then generally in Canada, we're using Cyborg D up front, uh, which would be given as induction prior to transplant. And typically we do four or six cycles of that treatment. We then get the stem cells and do the autologous stem cell transplant. And then generally there's some type of therapy, whether that's 
some more intensive treatment for a couple of months followed by maintenance therapy to try to keep the response that you got from the autologous stem cell transplant lasting as long as possible. What I wanted to demonstrate here is that in either arm, there's some type of ongoing treatment for myeloma patients. And the idea now is that myeloma patients will always be on some type of therapy if it's tolerated. The days of receiving a short course, whether that's nine months or um, uh, four months of treatment and then stopping are generally um, over. And if we can, we try to give patients some type of treatment for as long as they're responding. Just a few definitions so that as we go forward, um, kind of some of the terminology is, is well known. We tend to use the, the generic name and the trade names interchangeably. Um, and so bortezomib is, is also Velcade. Uh, lenalidomide is also known as Revlimid. Pomalidomide, the, the brand name is Pomalis. Carlfilzomib also goes by Kiprolis. And Daratumumab is also, also goes by Darzalex. Just wanted to introduce a couple of the terms that we use when we're looking at clinical trial evidence, and we use clinical trial evidence to help us inform our treatment making decisions. And some of the evidence that the clinical trials show and the endpoints that they use are listed here. So, progression free survival is the time from either diagnosis or first treatment until you progress in your disease. And in multiple myeloma, we'll likely have several different progression-free survivals throughout the treatment course. Overall survival is the time from diagnosis until death, and that's either death from multiple myeloma or any other cause. Median, you'll often see, used quite a few times, and, and that's different from uh, mean. Mean is the average in whatever value that you're looking at. Median is the most frequent value in the range that's used. And minimal residual disease, or MRD, is the new kid on the block in terms of identifying how deep a response at a molecular level you can obtain with treatment thinking that at a molecular level, if you can get a very low or non-detectable disease, your outcomes are likely going to be better. So it's not just enough anymore to decrease the amount of monoclonal protein in the blood, but we really want to get to this minimal, minimal, minimal state in the body at a molecular level. So having said all of that as a bit of preamble, uh, Erwin and I were lucky enough to be able to go to Stockholm in June for the annual European Society of Hematology meeting um, and to prove that we did more than just eat Swedish meatballs, uh, we're going to present a couple of the presentations. So the first one uh, is looking at autologous stem cell transplant and, and particularly in older myeloma patients, and, and older is uh, kind of not very well defined, um, and therefore uh, we'd like to know if there's a subset of myeloma patients that are older, can they tolerate an autologous stem cell transplant, and, and do they do well with it? And the reason why we want to answer that question is because previous studies that have looked at the benefit of transplant, both here and here, versus chemotherapy alone, have really only looked at patients who are less than or equal to 65 years of age. And so the question as to whether or not transplant is tolerable or provides a benefit for patients over the age of 65 isn't well studied in clinical trials. And so the myeloma 10 
or sorry, the myeloma 11 trial that was initiated in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. which was a bit of a, a complicated trial, but essentially looked at a variety of populations, looked to see in this um, presentation whether or not groups of patients based on age and up to the age of 75 did well with transplant. And you can see here they got a few different types of induction treatment prior to transplant. If they were eligible, they went on to transplant, and then they did get either maintenance or observation. So in this whole trial, there were a bunch of different questions that were um, looking to be answered. But in this particular presentation, they focused on transplant eligible population and those who went on to transplant and particularly their outcomes based on their age. And so as you can see, if you look at the characteristics of the patients who were in this transplant eligible cohort, and particularly looking here at the age range, you can see that most of those who are transplant eligible were less than 65, but there still were considerable numbers of patients who were transplant eligible for the study between 65 and 69 and 70 to 75. Um, and so it's those age ranges that were evaluated. So age definitely has an impact on whether or not patients undergo a transplant um, when they're considered fit enough. And you can see that the percentage of patients undergoing a transplant is higher if you're less than 65 than as you get older. And you can see here that there are a variety of reasons why even if patients were considered transplant eligible, they didn't go on to get a transplant. Um, and the uh, gray box is 70 to 75 years of age. The orange box is 65 to 69. And then the blue box are those patients less than 65. And so you can see that for older patients, some of the main reasons why patients didn't go on to transplant, even though they likely were considered candidates, is that patients themselves decided that that wasn't a good option for them. So it's important to recognize here that if you go for a transplant from a progression-free survival point of view, so again, that the time that you're diagnosed and received treatment to the time that you progress, patients who are 70 to 75 do a little bit worse than their younger cohorts. But from an overall survival point of view, they look to be doing just as well. And these are based on kind of the proportion of patients that are alive and progression fee, or the proportion of patients that are alive. And on the bottom, we have months since they entered the trial. But importantly, when you look at the outcomes of age match patients who either did or didn't undergo a transplant, it's obvious based on this red curve here that as long as you got to a transplant, independent of your age, you did better, both in progression-free survival and overall survival. So transplant is still a very important treatment modality for patients, and if we can get them there and think they're going to tolerate it, it definitely is uh, or does, at least in this study, shows it provides some benefits. People ask still the maintenance question. So um, is the benefit of transplant for these patients um, uh, independent of the maintenance uh, that they might go on after transplant? And these two uh, slides or these two curves are essentially showing that yes, still going on for a transplant um, is important. Part of this trial looked at a frailty score to see if there was an ability to predict based on a score how patients were going to do with treatment. And in most of the 
scoring system was derived based on characteristics from patients that weren't going the, down the transplant pathway, so transplant not eligible. And this doesn't show up very well, but the overall survival for frail patients is definitely inferior to those who are intermediate or fit patients. However, you can see here that patients who are, in, are eligible for transplant but don't go on to transplant versus those who don't, aren't eligible for transplant have the same proportion of patients who are frail versus those who actually go on for transplant have a very minor percentage of people who would be considered frail by this uh, scoring system that was devised potentially leading clinicians and patients to have another objective way of determining how patients will do with transplant independence of their age and maybe based on a bit more objective criteria. So the conclusions of the authors when they presented this um, oral presentation was that transplant improves outcomes for patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, that transplant is less likely to be delivered to patients who are over 65, even though they are thought to be fit when they started the clinical trial. In older but fit patients, you can deliver uh, an autologous stem cell transplant with no additional transplant-related mortality. And therefore, the data supports the use of transplant as standard of care for all patients who are considered fit and who can tolerate initial induction chemotherapy independent of age. From a Canadian perspective, the majority of centers across Canada don't have a firm age cutoff for taking patients to transplant. And so this study kind of confirms the, the, the current Canadian practice, at least at most centers. So that's the end of that presentation, and I'll uh, now turn it over to Erwin to take us into the relapse and refractory setting. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Just make sure my mouse is controlling things. Perfect. So, uh, as mentioned, by Dr. Stachew, uh, we'll be chatting here for uh, probably about 18 to 20 minutes on refractory treatment, uh, some of the newer therapies that were discussed in Stockholm. Unlike Dr. Stachew, I have absolutely no problems or concerns talking to myself in my own office, uh, isolated, which often happens, I think, unfortunately here. So I'll go straight into it. Um, I think that the first thing that we see in um, out of Stockholm and uh, out of the last six months of therapies is we have a pretty good sense of what works in the first line. We know that a whole bunch of different medicines, uh, when combined with lenalidomide or Revlimid, seem to work really well. And a lot of those therapies are available across Canada. The next question is, we have this next um, generation of medicines were a little bit stronger, a little bit more potent than Revlimid called pomalidomide. And I always describe it as being uh, the bigger brother of it. Well, when we use pomalidomide as it was originally developed, which was pomalidomide plus dexamethasone, uh, which is um, um, symbolized by the PD, portion on this slide, uh, it works pretty well um, and it's better than nothing. But most of us are feel that uh, we need to combine it with something else to really squeeze the most out of this particular medicine and get the most bang for our buck. So at the European meeting this year, uh, we saw a few different options actually that uh, are quite hopeful. I'll hone in on the first two but I always want to leave a meeting with some hope that there will be more development in the future than just what we can practically use right now. So in the upcoming months to years, I'll be looking very closely at the last three, which are antibodies or uh, specifically honed in and targeted molecules that go and really beat up the myeloma cell uh, as it is. So 
uh, as I said, I'll be talking more specifically about the first two uh, medicines here. So the first column highlights the results that we get when we use PD or pomalidomide and dexamethasone versus what we used to use, which was just the high dose dexamethasone alone. We can see that the time for the next progression was doubled, but still it was only about four months or so. So I would like to personally see things a little bit better. I'm spoiled in having seen months and months out of uh, some of the other medicines we have for multiple myeloma, and I would really want to get more out of it. The second column um, really, I think, helps us to understand why the addition of the C, which is cyclophosphamide, to the pomalidomide and dexamethasone is our current Canadian standard. Uh, I think it, most provinces allow us to use those three medicines, and once again, it doubles it further from about four months to just over nine months. There's some exploratory information on the daratumumab and carfilzomib, which is the K, but still these are very, very preliminary data sets. The uh, best data we have so far comes from a phase three trial, and there was two that were reported. The first used pomalidomide and dexamethasone, and uh, combined it with bortezomib or Velcade. A lot of people have seen Velcade before, and uh, it was the standard of care to combine Velcade with dexamethasone in a, as a doublet. Most people think, when looking at myeloma, that three drugs is probably better than two, and this is really what this trial was trying to combine. The other thought process behind this is the classes of medicines was the pomalidomide-based or immune modulatory drugs, when combined with the proteasome inhibitors, which is what Velcade is or bortezomib, uh, often uh, synergize and will work better together. So there is two theories really behind this uh, particular study. So this was a refractory trial, so RR, refractory or relapsed multiple myeloma which has seen one, two, or three previous treatments with at least two cycles of lenalidomide uh, were, was the patient population that was studied here. They looked at, they looked at bortezomib or Velcade uh, given on a slightly different schedule than I think a lot of people in Canada see, but one which the health authorities currently consider the standard of care, uh, just based on uh, regulatory issues. So given twice a week, let's say Monday, Thursday, the next week, Monday, Thursday, and then another week off. So four treatments in a 21-day treatment course versus adding pomalidomide into that treatment cycle as well. So when they followed people until they either relapsed due to progressive disease or had some form of toxicity. As you go along in your therapy, more and more treatments will mean that you'll be able to tolerate less and less medications. What was seen in the Velcade arm was that at the 12 month period, only about a third of people were still remaining. Once we got to the combination arm, we see that about half the amount of people are still on there, are still on the combination of medicines. And this is really, I think, a true benefit. Response, and that benefit was really compounded when people had this in their first line of relapse, having seen lenalidomide at least once before. And that response rate at the 12 month mark was almost about two thirds of people, so markedly better. People responded better, and this helped to predict that lengthening of therapy. So we can see that response rates were uh, more than 80%. And if your disease is less battle-hardened, you can see the response rates were up to about 90%. So this is truly an effective therapy. This worked in people that had seen lenalidomide or Revlimid before and whose disease had grown on it as well. 
So we often use this marker called the hazard ratio to help determine that the uh, what the margin of benefit was. So people did at least a third better with sur progression free survival going from just under six months to about nine and a half months in this uh, very battle hardened multiple myeloma population. If your disease had was not refractory or growing on the lenalidomide, then you got almost two years benefit out of this, which was truly incredible. The side effect profile was very similar between both uh, arms and with a, a, a safety profile that one would expect with pomalidomide, which I think most people agree uh, is very similar to what Revlimid looks like. And there was nothing shocking here. Um, However, we, we still don't like to give that Velcade twice a week given the neuropathies or nerve issues that can occur. So with a side effect profile very similar to medicines that people have seen before, having much more benefit, this is really, a, uh, I think, a, a new therapy that we would like to introduce in, in Canada if at all possible. It did significantly improve the statistics of response and progression-free survival and reduce the risk of dying and prog disease progression compared to the two um, medicines of Velcade and dexamethasone by themselves. So uh, in Canada, we do have some provinces where you may be able to get this. So if your doctor will be talking about palmolidomide, then you may ask them uh, about uh, this triplet combination. If you've seen Velcade before and your body has grown on it, then you may not be as eligible for this type of therapy. Or if your nerve damage from previous treatments has been uh, is, is too bad, then this may not be a, an option for you as well. The second treatment is one involving pomalidomide dexamethasone with a new drug called elotuzumab. This is a drug which is not available in Canada. Uh, it's an immune modulatory drug, which means it modifies and modulates your immune system. It physically pulls immune system cells towards the myeloma so your immune system can do what it's supposed to do, which is kill the cancer. This was using a population of people who were relapsed or refractory to a Velcade-like drug and lenalidomide or Revlimid. And you needed to have at least two prior treatments um, before receiving this. People either got pomalidomide dexamethasone or the pomalidomide dexamethasone with elotuzumab given intravenously. This medicine does have some uh, potential infusion issues. That's why a lower dose was given initially, and uh, it needs to be loaded into you so your body can uh, be saturated with it. And then it was given every four weeks after that first two-month cycle. If you're able to tolerate the first dose, which I think the majority of people are, then giving this medicine uh, is really a, a really intriguing option for people uh, currently in France and the United States, where it's available uh, as a potential standard of care. I have this slide looking at the population of people exposed in the therapy, and I really wanted to show that people were in the study had received many, many therapies before, Revlimid or lenalidomide, Velcade or bortezomib. Some people even had the uh, more potent version of bortezomib called carfilzomib with uh, almost 20%, uh, 30% of people having it, and some of the newer medicines as well. And this speaks to how many people were refractory to the combination, which was about two-thirds. So this is a population of myeloma, which is very aggressive. Uh, the thing to note was that there was a sizable number of people on the elotuzumab palmolidomide arm that were still on therapy uh, even at the um, at this early phase of the trial with a doubling number of people who um, were still receiving benefit from it. 
The progression-free survival uh, was one that one may expect for pomalidomide with, oops, my mistake, with uh, about 50% of people you can see here progressing after about four to five months. That fits with that first chart I, I showed you. Whereas looking at the 50% mark for the elotuzumab arm, you can see things were about doubled. And this is mapped out by that 4.7 months versus 10.3 months that you can see in the progression-free survival. So the addition of this medicine doubles the benefit. And this was seen in any high-risk population of people, including high-risk genetic features or high risk of a really explosive type of myeloma, signified by the LDH, which is a blood test that people can have done with your uh, multiple myeloma blood work every one to three months. The margin of benefit was seen was about the same in any of these subgroups of people. And it doesn't matter when you got when you got treated, the margin of benefit as measured by this hazard ratio was about the same with a roughly doubling of improvement. So um, the use of these immune system stimulators, um, which is one way of thinking of it, or harnessing the immune system to kill the cancer is certainly uh, a really um, attractive option for a lot of people. Uh, in the future with all, all of those medicines listed uh, that I was talking about before, darutumumab, isotuximab, and that MOR202 being future um, options that we're really looking forward to using in clinical trials and uh, hopefully as a standard of care in the future and years to come. Uh, the side effects of these therapies one can see is very, very similar from one category to the other. So really the elotuzumab didn't add too much side effects to uh, that combination of pomalidomide and dexamethasone. Uh, and uh, really, once again, not really too many more side effects seen in the combination arm versus uh, the control arm of just the pomalidomide and dexamethasone by itself. So this was really the first study looking at pomalidomide-based therapies with one of these antibodies, these highly targeted drugs against multiple myeloma with a doubling of responses and progression-free survival, which is, I think, really interesting. And uh, as of right now, the, um, the company making it uh, was still debating whether or not to bring this medicine to the regulatory authorities in, in Canada. So this is one that I hope that looking at this data, they will certainly um, look favorably upon providing it to some more patients within Canada, this, this potential option. It is a, it is a, a little bit of a time between these trials, of course, and, and market access. The uh, gorilla in the room, I guess, from the company standpoint, is that we have this really, really powerful medicine called Daratumumab, which they see as their competitor and uh, which is available in Canada. There might be people on this uh, phone call right now on it. And this is something that uh, is truly one of the most powerful anti-myeloma medicines there. And so um, this is the one that we may not understand truly how to use this elotozumab um, after daratumumab or how do we sequence some of these medicines to really get the most out of all the medicines that we have right now currently available in Canada. I was just going to speak very briefly on a couple of real world um, statistics here in my last two minutes uh, before handing it back to Dr. Stachew. There is an interesting poster which looked at cholesterol medicine or, or statins for people with multiple myeloma. They looked at people living in Sweden um, and people who had uh, were on these um, medicines, these statins, before uh, their diagnosis of myeloma and they compared it to people who didn't have multiple myeloma and matched the two and they showed that being on one of these statins 
made a very, very statistically significant but minor contribution to uh, to uh, delaying death by a little bit. And then they did the same thing for people after the diagnosis, just to make sure that you know was this just uh, is this an effect of the drug that can be seen after uh, the diagnosis, and uh, does it still have the same contribution? And it was still present for that multiple myeloma population there too. So normally I'm the type of person that likes to take away medicines from people um, when I see them in clinics, um, but I look a little bit more favorably for these statins now, these uh, cholesterol medicines, and uh, this is a uh, something that really needs to be validated, I think, with a phase three study before we start acting on it. But it's something that uh, I thought was really kind of interesting that medicine that can be used for something as simple as cholesterol may have some implications for uh, other disease types as well. So I'm just going to go quickly through this to um, the next last thing, which was. Uh, uh, one thing that I've always wondered is um, if people respond really, really quickly, I'm often quite happy and uh, when revealing these results to people in, in in the clinic. And sometimes you have people that just take a long time to actually show improvements in those M proteins, those myeloma proteins, those free light chain assays. So someone um, had a look at this and they said, you know, those people who are slower to respond, is there something different about them? Do they actually do better or worse? So they talked about this time to plateau and they used uh, a time period of uh, about a hundred, uh, let's see, ooh, wrong way. And uh, they found that people that took about four months or so to get to that point of uh, plateauing their responses. So if you had plateaued before four months or after four months, um, we will we'll term those people early responders or late responders. The fact that you responded was the most important thing. So really the key message was that you just have to respond and it, you don't have to fret if you don't see a, a massive drop in that protein numbers within the first four months or so. Things can take time, and as long as you do respond, um, which can take some uh, a little bit longer time period, then um, that's all that we're looking for, that month-to-month -month chipping away of the myeloma protein. So as, uh, as a physician, I don't have to have an itchy trigger finger to really uh, change the therapy unless there is still ongoing damage, let's say to kidneys, and you're, you're looking at dialysis. Uh, in those very specialized situations, we may consider changing therapies, but I think just sitting back, relaxing, and enjoying the benefit of a lot of the actual uh, potent therapies we have available right now is something that we just need to, to emph is emphasized by this particular therapy uh, or this particular abstract. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Stacku. Alrighty, so just to finish up, I wanted to talk about the potential for a really revolutionary new type of treatment in not only multiple myeloma, but a, a wide variety of hematologic and potentially solid tumor malignancies. And that's this CAR T therapy. So the CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor therapy. And it really is a completely different way of coming after cancer aside from kind of the chemotherapy and some of the, the targeted therapies. Just to point out that this, this CAR T therapy for multiple myeloma is not licensed anywhere. It's not licensed in the States, in Canada, or Europe. It's available by clinical trial only. And so from a multiple myeloma point of view, if I sound like I'm bumbling through it, it's because it's brand new and uh, certainly almost none of us in Canada have firsthand um, experience with the technology. If you've heard about immunotherapy for uh, blood cancers or solid tumor cancers or even multiple myeloma, CAR T therapy is a particular type of immune therapy that really uses the patient's own immune cells 
to go after the cancer. The thought is that cancer being as smart as it is, has the ability to shut off a patient's immune system. The immune system is really vital to recognize the cancer as being foreign to the body and attack it and get rid of it. And if the cancer cells are able to shut off the patient's own immune system, then the cancer is able to grow and cause problems. And so with immune therapy, and particularly this CAR-T therapy, we figured out a way to stimulate the patient's own immune cells to go after the cancer. So in a nutshell, we would, we being the royal we, um, would take white blood cells and a particular subset of those white blood cells called T cells. And those are a particular type of immune cell. And for those of you that have had an autologous stem cell transplant and had your stem cells taken out through the peripheral blood, this is pretty similar process. And so those T cells are uh, selected and then really um, uh, put together with a bunch of stimulatory molecules and then, which sounds like something out of a science fiction movie, um, those T cells are given a virus that has a particular, particular gene in it that will give those T cells a new receptor and allow that new receptor to recognize the cancer cell. So between these antibody beads that will stimulate the T cells to grow in number and the virus that causes the genes to be given to the T cell to make a new receptor, you then get these souped up T cells that can be reinfused into the patient's body. And hopefully these altered and souped up powerful T cells can then go and attack the body. Um, I'm gonna just fast forward these here. So um, in Canada, as I mentioned, we don't have the ability to deliver this at least as a funding funded mechanism and so we have sent some patients out of province to the United States to participate on clinical trials. And what I wanna show you here is that you can't just snap your fingers and say you want CAR T cells to be generated and infused the next day. Essentially, you would meet with the center for an appointment and then get those T cells taken out but then you have to generate those special T cells and that can take anywhere from a week to generally two to three weeks. And then they have to go and be infused back into the body. And then there's some time under observation to make sure that there's no complications. So it's a fairly committed process from patients, particularly if there's travel involved, because as you can see, there would be multiple trips to the site that is performing CAR-T. This likely won't, at least in the near future, be something that's offered at every center as it's quite laborious to do and as is turning out to be extremely expensive. So this is the part where I might bumble through a little bit because what I wanna show you is that in multiple myeloma, and the trial that I want to talk about, there is this particular um, CAR T cell design, and there's a lot of different CAR T cells being produced, but in multiple myeloma, one of the first kids on the block is this BB2121. And essentially, this part right here is the whole genetically engineered part. This is kind of the receptor, and what you can do with these CAR T receptors is link them to a bunch of different molecules, stimulatory molecules, signaling molecules, linker molecules, and depending on how you design the 
receptor and alter the receptor, you'll get different amounts of binding to tumor cells and uh, you'll be able to either have more or less side effects uh, from the uh, CAR T cell infusion, which I'm going to talk about in a sec. So just pictorially here, this is the T cell and this virus has the gene in it to make the receptor. And if you introduce the virus to the T cell, hopefully that new gene gets adopted into the T cell. The gene is responsible for making the protein, which is the receptor and all of those fancy signaling molecules. And it's that receptor that will then go and bind to a marker on the outside of the tumor cell. Um, and then hopefully cause that tumor cell to die. That's the idea in CAR T in general. So with this particular study and really where we are in the CAR T cell therapy for multiple myeloma is still in the early phase clinical trial. So the phase one part of the clinical trial is really looking at the optimum dose of T cells that, uh, that you could infuse into the body, both in order to get the response you're looking for, but also to uh, not have a whole pile of side effects. The second part was to see whether or not the amount of, res uh, the amount of markers on the outside of those tumor cells make a difference in the T cells being able to recognize the markers and the cancer cells and then destroy the cancer cells. So what I wanted to show you is that really when we're doing these studies, these are patients that have had every last line of therapy available to them, generally as we say pentarefractory. So the initial studies are really being done in a, a truly exposed and refractory patient population. Um, CAR T cell therapy isn't without some potential side effects. And as newer and newer CAR T cells get designed, those side effects seem to be less and less. But a couple ones of interest that are potentially um, uh, not without um, the need for intensive care unit in a short period of time and some scary reactions is the cytokine release syndrome. So when you, when you boost the immune system in the body, you run the potential of really boosting the immune system and having other aspects of the immune system release a bunch of, for lack of a better word, chemicals or hormones in the body that can stimulate a, a bunch of different problems with organs in the body. There is a medication that can help fix that. And so between that medication and some new advances in the, the CAR T cells, we're, we're getting better and better. Neurotoxicity, so some alterations in brain function um, can happen also uh, with this product. Um, really what I wanted to show you here that in the initial parts of the trial, they did find that a dose greater than 150 seemed to be um, beneficial, dose of 50, not so much, and that it really didn't matter the expression of that marker by the tumor cell, whether you had low expression or high expression, you seem to have fairly decent response rates to the CAR T cell infusion. I talked initially about the minimal residual disease. And essentially in all people who responded to CAR T that we evaluated for minimal residual disease, they were all negative. And so if you responded and you were evaluated for MRD, you did really, really well. If you were MRD positive after your CAR T cell infusion, you didn't do as well. So again, getting that really deep response is really important. So with their conclusion, they've looked 
Um, so far, based on the trial, they have a median progression free survival of about 11 or 12 months. Again, if you were responding and we could evaluate for MRD, it was 100%. Um, there were comparable response rates independent of how much marker you have for that T cell on the outside of their cancer cells. And now they're getting pretty good at reversing some of the side effects. So in Canada, we know that this target on the outside of the myeloma cell is an effective treatment target. We hope that as time goes on, we're going to be getting better survival rates. This is being done in a really uh, exposed and refractory patient population, and so 12 months right now is really not a bad number, and hopefully as the trial goes out, it'll be longer. There is currently one site in Canada that is participating in the clinical trial, and across Canada, we're now trying to figure out our CAR T cell strategy so that we are going to be able to get used to the construct, not necessarily as a clinical trial, but also as a funded modality for treatment. And so at that, I think I'll close and ask from uh, Gabrielle if there's any questions from people. So uh, yeah, we do have a few questions that, that came in and uh, please, uh, if you have any other questions, please uh, type them in now. And, and so as we get through the first, first uh, questions, then we'll be able to move on to those. Um, so the first question, I, I'd like to remind everyone uh, also um, please, uh, if the question is personal in nature, uh, it, it shouldn't, it's not a type of question that could be answered um, in this form. Um, anyways, so um, the first question, I'm not sure I understand it correctly, but um, it, it pertains to uh, the first thing you talked about, Dr. Stack, you, the, um, the uh, transplant eligibility and with, with the age. You know? And uh, a patient is asking, uh, for example, if someone is uh, in their 50s and has already had myeloma, has been tr being treated for it for tr being treated for about five years, um, are there any other references? Uh, uh, in essence, can you have a stem cell transplant uh, second line? I think that's what the question is asking. So, uh, short answer, and Erwin, feel free to jump in. I mean, short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, Generally, the thought is that if you've had a really good bang for your buck with the first transplant, i.e. you've stayed in some type of remission post-transplant of two to three years, doing it again after you've progressed uh, provides you with benefits. Um, if you don't get the benefit of probably at least a couple of years, doing it again probably won't provide you as much benefit as if you went on to some of the other novel agents in second or third line. So, Erwin, anything you wanted to add? No, I would uh, just agree with that. And maybe a lot of that data was from the pre-maintenance era uh, with Revlimid, because we give Revlimid after bone marrow transplants now. Now that we have maintenance uh, Revlimid, I think the number might be skewed in a lot of people's minds across Canada, maybe three years because we think the transplant will only offer you a second transplant, maybe 50% uh, of the length of time as the first one. So um, you really have to be a bit cautious in knowing that someone is a bit more beat up than their first transplant and a few years older than their first transplant and uh, look at their tolerability from that first transplant to see uh, if they're still eligible or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So the, the next questions all pertain to uh, CAR T cell therapy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Surprising. Um, so the first one is, uh, you know, is there, is there a realistic time frame, you know, that we can see CAR T cell therapy available in Canada? Oh, um, yes. I mean, I, I it's going to come later for myeloma than it is going to come for lymphoma and potentially acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, it is already licensed um, in the United States, at least two different products for lymphoma. Um, so the time frame, uh, and I'm guessing here, I would think probably in the next three or four years. Um, that's just my guess for myeloma. 
based on clinical trial data maturity and then the process of going through Health Canada and the funding mechanisms. Um, Erwin, not sure if you have similar thoughts? I, I agree. The biggest hurdle will be the regulatory because these CAR T's are not drugs, they're cells. So right now in the US, in Europe, and in Canada, the regulatory authorities don't quite know how to handle these things. So uh, I think the FDA in the United States has been a bit more forward thinking with some guidances recently in, uh, released on July 11th uh, about these therapies. So I think the rest of us will be following the United States' lead on this. Um, as a standard of care, I would say years, I agree with you. Uh, from a clinical trial standpoint, there may be places offering this therapy um, possibly as early as late next year, um, but it's, uh, it's going to depend on a lot of different factors. So um, it's tricky to say, and uh, there is no phase three study which proves that this works for myeloma, Just, and you're entirely correct, and this could be something where there's a lot of um, shine right now, but may not end up bearing out the, the sort of full... Um, the full luster, I guess. Uh, so we just have to wait and see. It is very, very attractive, though, and a huge new infrastructure needs to be built in to a lot of cancer centers. So that's what we're in the midst of doing right now. In addition to chemotherapy, radiation, we have to build in these CAR T facilities as well. So that's going to take time and money. And just just to let you know, in the United States, uh, it, it's costing about five hundred thousand dollars a CAR T cell infusion. So um, it's it's not going to be a cheap endeavor, that's for sure. Thank you. Um, so the next question um, says, you know, are are is the medical community thinking CAR T cell therapy uh, could be a cure for myeloma? Um, um, go I would, ahead, I, would, I was going to say, um, I think we always want to think that something is a potential cure. Uh, unfortunately, when we first test out these treatments, they're tested in people who have seen two, three, four, five, seven, ten different therapies before. So out of the most battle-hardened myeloma, uh, that's when we end up seeing these responses. And it just it takes time, three to five years, to even move it to second-line or first-line setting. We need a bit more time um, to really predictably answer that question. I think people will respond to the therapy. The question is, how durable will be that response and what are the side effects? Because if the side effects are not so nice, then you could be left with some form of um, disability as well. So these are the questions that need to be answered by the phase three studies. So everyone has great hope in it but we just need more time and more data. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is just asking, what was the site for, that the CAR T cell therapy is uh, is available at? Uh, they didn't have a chance to mark it down, and that it's uh, Princess Margaret Hospital um, in Toronto. So uh, Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto, if you don't have that. Um, if you'd like to find the uh, the trial online, you can always go to Myeloma Canada's website. We have a clinical trial finder, and um, you'll be able to to, to find uh, to find it there as well. Um, so, the next question, and I, I you know, it's uh, it's getting late. We're we're five minutes over time, and so uh, maybe we could uh, we could end off with with uh, with this one. Um, no. So look, I can't ask I can't ask that question. So I think I think with that um, we're going to uh, we're going to end the webinar. Yeah, maybe we'll give them an extra minute if uh, if anyone else wants to uh, wants to ask another question, I'd be happy to to, to ask it. Um, if not, we'll uh, just 30 more seconds and then we'll end the webinar. Uh, while we wait for that, I just want to thank you, uh, doctors uh, Stakyu and um, and uh, Sandu for for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be able to. To ask this, uh, to be able to, to give uh, this presentation um, is very informative. 
and I'm sure uh, everyone uh, you know feels the same way. So no uh, no other questions. So uh, with that, we'll uh, we'll leave it there. So uh, have a great evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, stay tuned for uh, for the next webinar. You'll receive uh, an email invitation for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.